Tommy Campbell, thanks for joining me. The Cassius Morris Show. Oh boy, what are you drinking? I got a I got a pint of Guinness. That's a that's a solid day beer. A pint of Guinness. Yeah, that is a solid day beer. You probably feel like you're out on a patio right now. <laughs> well, a lot of people don't realize uh, Guinness is like it's only four point two percent. I think people see it as a dark beer and they think it's like stronger or heavier, but it's not. It's just a little less carbonated and uh yeah it's light enough that i can have it at one doing a podcast with you and not feel bad about myself <laughs> right yeah it's true because you are drinking more and smoking more and everything i think everyone is yeah right now smoking more having more edibles i've got the what do i got down Uh-oh. here i always have a fun stash of everything <laughs> i've got um for, for those watching around the world in, in Canada, uh, this is 100% legal. And we actually have like government stamps on stuff. They tax an, that. Ex- extremely childproof container. But this was about, I think it was nine bucks or 10 bucks. And you get five pieces of chocolate. And uh, I've always been a lightweight. So I only need a piece just to, it's kind of like having a glass of wine. So um, mm-hmm. I really like the edibles. Uh, Especially in the midst of a respiratory illness. Um, yeah. I think now is as good a time ever for people to transition to uh, um, at least get away from smoking to vaporizers and maybe get away from vaporizers to, uh, to edibles. But again, totally legal here in Canada. Taxed. Taxed, government, it's all good to go. No, it's true. You it's all good your... to do. You just buy it at the store. That's it. <laughs> it's exactly. Great. It's interesting here. You mentioned your your stash back there. There is various drinks back there too. You showed your beer. Now I don't know if people know this, but we we've, we've known each other for a while. And f- for the second time in a row now, when I went to Vancouver, you took me out on a brewery tour down to Port Moody. And and last time you took me to a couple different ones. Um, so talk to me about your love for craft beer. Like when did you get introduced to that and sort of start taking it more seriously? Uh, hmm. Uh, to me, I just like. I like beer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so you've always liked beer. That, so I've always, well, no, I, I wouldn't say I've always liked beer because, I mean, the, f- the first time I got drunk, I was very sick and I didn't drink for two years. Wow. Uh, I was that guy uh, when I was younger. Um, it, 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 it did not go well with me. Mm-hmm. Booze did not go well with me. My stomach was not ready for it. As I think most young people are, that's half the reason there is a drinking age. But yeah. uh, so I was always a designated driver, and and uh, I was totally fine with that. And it wasn't until later in life that I started drinking. Uh, I don't know. I was just behind everyone. You began to um, partake. Yeah. Well, I just. I mean, I I really had a. a a, a rough experience, you know, my, my first time getting drunk. What are we talking uh, like a bunch well, of shots? Okay, well, all right, we're on a podcast. Let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's Stare talk about out. this. So, I, so I grew up in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, and basically my, my best friend was Chinese and his older brother was also Chinese. Um, and in Calgary, I wouldn't say, I'm not trying to define it. It was definitely on a place where my friend could use his older brother's ID and them both, you know, is they're just like, it's like the thing, all white people look the same, Mm -hmm. but to the white people, it like, he looked nothing like his brother, but But his brother was seven in Calgary without question. If you wanted a porno, if you wanted <laughs> booze, if you wanted cigarettes, if you wanted anything, we got um, my buddy Mike to get it, and he used his his big brother's ID. And again, they looked nothing like each other, mm-hmm. nothing. I mean, his brother was a big, really wide, thick guy. Yeah. And in his driver's license photo, he was giving a thumbs up and wearing a Hawaiian shirt because this was you could do this then. <laughs> like now, you have to right if you get a passport photo or anything. Now you have to be like. Yeah. Deadly serious. Uh, so long and short was, uh, he, he got his, he got his brother's ID and we rented a motel room because oh. that was the thing as young people. Uh, you rent a motel room, he got the booze 
and we all said we were sleeping over at a different friend's house. Mm-hmm. Did, you, did you ever do that when you were a kid? It's the classic move. I'm at his house. Where we're at okay. his house. <laughs> yeah, and we were all at we were all at like a fucking seedy motel on a McLeod Trail in Calgary. It was called the Flamingo. And um, yeah, we just checked into there. And uh, we were pounding beers and then other stupid stuff that kids buy because they think it'll be easy, like schnapps and coolers and really sugary, horrible things. And last thing I remember was I I woke up in a bathtub covered in sick and I couldn't find any of my friends that weren't in the room. I I was really like hospitalized level ill. Right. And uh, this is the middle of winter. And because the motel when you open the door, it opens outside. Right. And I, I opened the door to see if my friends were maybe outside smoking. Cause this was early nineties. Everybody smoked, mm-hmm. especially in Alberta. And cause I heard people out there and I opened it up to look for them and the door clicked behind me. Oh shit. So, so it was about minus 25 minus 30. I'm in the balcony uh, in my underwear covered in puke. Oh. Holy and, shit. uh, yeah, it was like, I mean, I really was still sick. It, this is like the absolute worst case scenario. And, uh, I couldn't go to the front desk because I wasn't a 22 year old Chinese man that had rented the room. <laughs> right. And I was like, like, covered in puke. I'm ta- like, I was like, I'm talking, I was 14 here, like man, really young. That's crazy. Yeah. And, um, so, uh, I mean, a couple doors down, some people were having a party at the motel. Oh. And uh, sure, like they were having their, their party in their room, but they were much older. Is this in the morning? And No, this is, this is like it. Well, the morning is in like 1 a.m. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, so, this is so like 1 a.m. Like so they're all out there on the patio and they see this kid standing there shivering in his <laughs> underwear. And uh, they took care of me. They like... They brought me in their room and, I don't know, put a towel around me. I don't really remember a lot of what went on that room. Um, that, that sounds really bad <laughs> now that I'm saying that out loud. I like, but mm. <laughs> uh, I just I just remember, like, the couple, like, the ladies, the ladies took care of me, like, nursed me a bit. And uh, they just waited for the guy. My friends had gone out to get some food. I, I mean, I didn't know, but they didn't let me know they were going or if they did, I didn't remember. So they came back and then the, this, these party people delivered me back to my friends, uh, where I spent the rest of the night throwing up everywhere. Yeah. And then the next day when we went to go home, we were jumping in my friend's minivan and my friend reversed really quickly. And my friend Neil hadn't closed his door yet. Mm. And the minivan door hit the car next to us and bent all the way forwards. Oh, damn. Like, his door was facing the hood. Jesus. Like, completely bent. <laughs> and and us being kids, uh, like, genuinely kids. Yeah. We were kids, right? Yeah. My, 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 my buddy who, uh, like, I was like, maybe 14, 15, but my buddy mm-hmm. was driving because he was 16. He was the one with the much older brother. But even then, like, I think he failed two grades or something. That's why we had a 60-year-old friend. It was, you know, the plot <laughs> thickens here. But, but like, okay, so this is how kids think. The door's completely bent forward. And but what do we do? Like, we can't go home? I mean, this is a minivan door bent all the way forward. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, And one of us is like, let's take it to Jared's brother. Like we just thought my friend's big brother, because he had some tools, right, was just gonna like fucking do body work and replace this door. And we and right. so we drove, we drove like forty five minutes to like the suburb he lived in. Showed up to the front of his house with a with a with a van with a door not on it, like like <laughs> talking a FedEx sliding door truck, and like rang his doorbell while I was still sitting in the back of the van puking in a bucket. <laughs> And um, they're like, yo, is uh, it, it sounds like a made up name because uh, he's like, is Delaney here? <laughs> like, and he came outside and he's like, what's up? And they're like, yeah, we fucked up the door. And he's like, 
Oh, I can't fix that. that yeah. You need to go to like, <laughs> you need to go it's to like, like an nuts. actual, <laughs> like we did, I don't know what we were thinking. So I, I was too sick to go home and I went and had to hide somewhere till I felt better. Oh my God. So that was your first drinking experience. I, I like literally had to go hide somewhere. Jesus like, Christ. It was, it was insane. It was insane. Be seen like that. Yeah, it was enough to put my – oh, no, my parents would have disowned me. Like, I mean – yeah, I mean I lied about where I was. There's so many elements. And, and it's just dangerous and stupid, but that's what kids are. Kids do stupid things, and I did a lot of stupid things, but I learned from them. I got really sick, and I was like, all right, I, I'm not like – you know, my friends continued to you know, steal beers or get, get them on the weekends, and then I was like, nope. And it wasn't until uh, like – my 18th birthday, I think, that I had another drink. So it was like four years or yeah, so, right? Big and even then, even then, I was like, I'm cool to be the designated driver. And and my friend, it's funny though with the designated driver thing, because when you live in the suburbs and there's no like Uber, or Lyft, or anything back then, yeah, uh, you have to have a driver. And I still remember we all had this one friend that it would be his whenever it was his turn to drive, he still drank, and we're like, <laughs> we were like, what the fuck, like. Like if, when it was your turn to drive, you just whatever had Coke and watched the uh, morons, you know, right. whatever. It's your turn. But he was like, you take one for the team. Yeah. When it was ever his turn to drive, I knew he's just going to drink. It was just a nightmare. So <laughs> That's anyway, so so I was a latecomer to it. Um, yeah. Growing up uh, in Calgary, they had a small brewery called Big Rock. And then another one called Brewster's. So that was like my sampling of, oh, there's other things than like the crappy big stuff. Yeah. But I think if you really want to trace it back, it wasn't uh, until I was in California and uh, I tried a beer called Sierra Nevada. And I think they were one of the big pioneers mm. with craft brewing. Uh, their their pale ale was like the gold standard. And uh, so that kind of, oh, beers can taste like this. They just don't, don't taste like whatever you get at a hockey arena. Right. Um, uh, the UK, when I lived there, had a small scene, just a very small scene. When I lived there, now it's huge. Yeah. So when I moved back from England to Vancouver, I just couldn't believe it because breweries were just, as I showed you, I mean, there's streets with a dozen on them. Like they're just Insane. popping up like everywhere. So what I liked, um, and I hope your listeners don't mind my long winded, um, covered in puke bent door minivan this is what answer. They want. they want everything. <laughs> this is what they want. Yes. They're real. Um, so what I like and what I pointed out to you when we were at a craft brewery, I said, what is different here than going to a pub? And you looked around for a minute and I said, what isn't here? And then you notice they said TVs. And that's true. When yeah. you go to a, a, a craft brewery, you're supporting something local. They always try and source everything from very close, uh, whether it's the food or the, the ingredients like here you'll get a BC hops and stuff, but it's conversation. When you're in a craft brewery, not everyone is fixated on a game and yelling at a screen or whatever. People are just hanging out and talking and they allow kids to. Uh, so that's, and it makes it even more family, which again, living in England, that was a very interesting, interesting thing to go to a pub, pub meaning public house. Mm -hmm. It's a public house. To congregate, not necessarily and, yeah, the same age. Yeah. And you could, yeah, you could bring kids and it, it, there's even, even there, it's nuts. Like you can have a drink. I mean, it might be as like young as 15 or something. You're allowed like one light beer or cider when accompanied by an adult and stuff. So yeah, it's just a nice kind of family thing. Not everyone has to go out and get fucked up. It's yeah. just, it's cool to sit in a brewery, try their different things with some friends, walk, try another one. But its main thing is it's conversation. So yeah, no, they've it's... they've taken the focus away from everyone watching sports to just hanging out with each other, and I really like that. So yeah, good booze, good times, and uh, I'm having Guinness because, like I said, it's a good day one. But I also am a dual citizen. I'm also Irish, and I spent a lot of time working in Ireland, and um, it takes me back. It takes you back. I love that. When you talk about 35 countries, what are some of the, I guess I could, I could ask, what's the biggest impression that's been made on you 
throughout these ex- experiences? Like, was there a certain place that you're like, wow, I, I learned so much from going here specifically or Asia, Asia, hundred percent Asia. Cause you just learn about like, like just poverty. <laughs> like, yeah. Like I remember like, uh, I've been to Thailand several times and, uh, one, one, on one of our trips, uh, you know, like a, a bar can be literally a, like a, a shack on the beach, right? Like, mm-hmm. like two stools, a piece of wood, and the guys picking pineapples and coconuts and putting Thai rum in it. So wow. my wife and I would go to this one beach shack quite often. And so we get to know the two guys, the, the two bartenders, and we always tip really well because – uh, you know, like uh, I had a pina colada is like a fucking dollar. So yeah. you can either be the guy that's like, hey, dollar drinks. You can be the guy that's like, I'm going to pay five dollars. It's still going to be way cheaper. And these guys are minds are going to be blown. Like, yeah. so we always tip really generously. And uh, this was in the island of Koh Samui. And the guy said, hey, I got Sunday off. If you want to uh, have a tour of the island, like I've got my Jeep mm-hmm. and uh it was, you know, he, he also worked at a hotel or something. So he had like a company, like he had access to this vehicle. Oh, cool. And we thought, well, this is really cool. Like, he's like, I will show you like my Thailand. And this was like our fifth trip. So we're like, we've never done anything like this. So he picks us up at the hotel. And then before we set off, he had to grab something from his house that he forgot. And we pulled up to like a shed, like a tin shed. <laughs> A fucking shed, man. Wow. And first thing is, when we got out, he's like, here, come in. Like, we'll go meet my kids and my wife and stuff. And first thing I I noticed is that he had chickens. And I'm a big foodie. Um, For those that aren't following me, I I, I do a lot of uh, 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 food videos. And I post a lot of my different cooks. And I'm a big barbecue guy. So I get excited when I see food stuff. So it's like, oh, wow, you got chickens. Uh, like I'm like wicked fresh eggs and stuff, and he goes, "No, they're for fighting." For fighting, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my god, okay, all right." Different he was world like here. insulted that you would think he would. He was insulted, food. yes, insulted. <laughs> like, no, oh, they're for fighting. And um, if you're offended by me doing his accent, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling a story, and it's like if I'm reading a story to my kid, and I'm like, "Oh," and the the sheep went bad. I, I got it. You got to do, you know, that's what it sounded like. That's what, he, that's what it sounded like. <laughs> so he opens like the tin thing to his house and it's like dirt floor, wow. uh, a mattress, like a wire running from the ceiling through something else. I mean, it's, 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 uh, like I go camping with better covering. That's insane. But he was the happiest guy in the world. His wife was the happiest woman. His kids were lovely. Wow. And they never looked for a second, like, oh, look at us, poor me. And he drove us all around the island. We went to, you know, other places. Like, uh, just just gave us a, 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 a taste of things. Yeah. And it wasn't like, he wasn't trying to show us a CD underside or anything. We, we He showed us all nice things. But it was just nice to be with someone that lived there and to see their happiness. And, yeah. and, and, and learn from that. And there's a book that I highly recommend. It's called The Paradox of Choice. And the book is about how the cultures with the most things are the most depressed and the cultures with the most choices are the most depressed. Uh, The easiest way to think of it is like this. If you went to a restaurant and you open up the menu and there's like folds out sprays and there's like, fuck, you know, we get every kind of cuisine possible, right? Mm Mm-hmm. That's a stressful ordering experience because you don't know what to get. There's right. so many things. Too but many. if you went to a restaurant and you're like, we make an amazing burger, we make this amazing pasta, and here's the fish and shit. Like just three things or four things, you're like, oh, well, this is easy. I'm going to have the chicken or the fish kind of thing. Yeah. And so this book shows you that on a larger scale and actually teaches how to make choices faster and to train your brain because – it's not the choice that overwhelms you. It's the fear of regret. So mm. it's the, it's not that you're not enjoying yours. It's that you're looking across the table going, I wish I had ordered that. Right. Or maybe, looking maybe around you. 
and and so yeah, and so this whole book is all about this. Wow. So um, it was just interesting seeing uh, some of the poverty there, and then noticing the happiness of these people, and uh, you know, money isn't the answer to everything. Uh, mm. You know, you you can be very rich and you can be unhealthy. You can be very rich and you can be depressed. So uh, that was a big one in Thailand. Um, but I didn't see real poverty till I like went to the Philippines where they like people live in garbage dumps, like actual, they live in garbage. Yeah. And I hadn't seen like the little kids on the street, uh, like slumdog millionaire style, mm-hmm. just climbing over your car. Um, some of them don't even have clothes. They're that poor asking for money. Wow. Um, it's seeing the level of poverty and then seeing the happiness of the people and stuff. But just that put it just put stuff in perspective, you know. Uh, Did you perform in the great Philippines? Thing. Yes. Wow. Yeah. What was that like? Fantastic. Whenever you do shows, like if I've done shows, I've done shows like Hong Kong, Tokyo, uh, the Philippines, uh, you know, Singapore, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, all those places, wow. you're playing to people that live there. You're playing to... English, Americans, Canadians, Australians, Germans that live there. And so if you think of it like this, if you're walking down the street uh, and you see a poster in English and it's got like a Canadian flag on it and a, a Union Jack on it and stuff, you're like, what the hell is that? And, and it's written in all in English and everything. It gets your attention. So mm-hmm. uh, these comedy promoters have been successfully putting on shows in places like that for decades. That's crazy. Because it's because, yeah, because it's a big thing too. like all the expat community. They all go to the shows like it's it's the thing to do, like yeah. whatever the weekend, the month that they have it, they they sell them out. They all sell them out. So wow. the only uh, like Filipino people at the shows would have been uh, if someone was married or had a girlfriend. Mm. So something like that. Uh, that makes sense. What but yeah, so like? yes. Yeah, so, well, Dubai again, uh, that's the ultimate like wealth and poverty in the same place. Yeah, talk about right? the, like the change kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, like in Dubai, I mean, I've been there a lot over the years. I haven't been in probably seven years. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I was there before the, the big Burj Al Khalifa, whatever it was is called, was even built. Yeah. And then I was there during when it was built. And then I saw it finished wow. or about to be finished. So I've, I've seen it over the years. Um, uh, Dubai is just, I mean, it's clean, it's safe, it's friendly. The people are lovely. The food's incredible. I mean, guaranteed sunshine. Like you can't beat those things. But when you see the poverty, because all those buildings, um, it's been widely reported that they're built by slaves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there's a lot of, I don't know, 60 minutes or nightline pieces on this. Uh, and we would be driving, uh, like on the highway and I would see thousands of people, thousands just walking up the side of the road. And I'd be like, what, what is all this? And there, and then the local, our drivers, like those are the slaves that build all our, all our buildings. And they all live in like a shanty town outside of the city. They all have to walk they like walk. an hour and a half. Yeah, like an hour and a half each way every day. What? And they work like it. This is a place that gets to be like 55 degrees Celsius yeah. and they work all day. And um, yeah, it's always been said that, again, endless articles on this. Uh, so I'm just repeating what I've learned uh, from being there and then seeing stuff, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. uh, I'm not a reporter. I'm just saying what I've seen. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so you're you're dirt poor in the Philippines and a company says, hey, come help build these skyscrapers and you'll be able to make a bunch of money and you can send it back to your family. And then as soon as they get there, they're tossed in terrible accommodation. The employer takes their passport they said we'll hang on to this for safety, what? and they don't and they and they don't let them leave. Uh, yeah, they take their passport. Kinda... Do they ever give it back? No, it's just again, this is like wild, widely reported, mm-hmm. um, and 
they had to make all these human rights laws. Like they're not allowed to work above 50 degrees or something like that. Oh my God. But then what Dubai would do is they'd have the never, they would never have the official published temperature above that. Oh. Um, That's the thing. Yeah. They can control it. Like they can just say it's whatever. It's like China. Like when there's all these questions about the, the numbers and stuff, it's like, you can really just say whatever. Yeah. So um, that's exactly what was going on there. And that's so crazy. It was, it was really depressing because I was very excited the first time we went to the Middle East. I was like, I'm a Star Wars guy. I'm like, this is like Tatooine. This is yeah, really this exciting. Is crazy, this is, yeah. <laughs> and it was so foreign. And, you know, a- again, super clean. Like, there's no like street crime and graffiti. It's just really nice. And everyone you meet in the hotel, everyone's really nice. Uh, so, then you peel back that layer and you start to learn about some things and again how those buildings are built and then you Mm. like those people aren't walking down the highway for fun or for fitness like they don't have a choice um uh yeah so that kind of thing kind of screws it up so after like learning about that i wasn't in a rush to go back Mm -hmm. um that makes sense. See, that's something I wasn't aware of. Because I'm a good, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I, I have trouble like stomaching certain things like that. Um, if they've changed that and those people are taken care of now, then sure, I'd love to go back and do shows. But, you know, when, when the gigs would come up on offer, I'd still, I'd still just have trouble like going, man, like once I learned how poorly people were treated and then it did the mildest bit of investigation myself. I'm like, Oh yeah, they're wow. Okay. Yeah. There was something like they created some like human rights council. Like, so like they created their own, some sort of tribune to monitor, uh, how these people were being treated. And they had zero cases because it's like, okay, we'll create the thing, but (laughs) nothing is ever going to be brought here. So it's like for publicity or for image. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's but, so, so it makes me wonder but if still, they have so much money, why don't they just send a bus and like have like at least a livable place? Like I, I don't know what the answer to that question. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, guess it's anyone's guess, I, but like I, I it's just it, it makes no sense if, if you're in such a rich place. Like I remember reading stuff about some of those guys, you know, having their names inscribed in the sand that can be read from space. It's like if you're if you're doing that type of stuff with money, why why can't you get a bus? <laughs> It's just, you know, it's, it's insane. The, the inequality it is, it is crazy to think about. Would you say the, the UK was one of your favorite places? Cause I, I hear you speak very fondly of the UK or was it elsewhere that was your favorite? Well, there's different kinds of favorites. Like okay. what types? I, I love, I love where we live right now. I love Vancouver. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just a beautiful, like you walk outside, just smells amazing. Um, there's fantastic ingredients if you like to cook. There's great restaurants. You got the mountains. You got ocean. It's it's a wonderful place. Like, so I really like it here. Uh, I really like California. Um, I really liked the UK, but for different reasons. Like, here is more of a nature. I'm fascinated by you know uh, the nature here is so nice. Like I said, that air and stuff. Very Whereas diverse. I, so I lived in central London. So that was very exciting, mm-hmm. right? To, to be there um, in my 20s to early 30s was an awesome place to be. Like every night of the week, you had your pick of like a massive concert, a, a, a play. There was always something huge going on. Yeah. Like just, it's one of the most exciting cities in the world. Um, it smells like pee, but <laughs> it's not like- It doesn't smell like you're, everywhere. <laughs> It, it, yeah, it's, it does smell like pee because when you're downtown, like in the Soho, people are just like pissing in corners. And then they have the outdoor urinals too. Like they have urinals that they are just outdoor. like the – Yeah, so there's big gray things in the middle of the street to stop people from pissing in the street. And you and you just stand there and piss like people are just walking by. And at first you're like, as if I'd use that. And you're like, well, do you want to like piss on someone's store like an asshole or yeah, risk smart. getting mugged in an alley or just like – they're like, look, people are going to do it no matter what. We put them there. And so I love their – they have a lot of like very genius things like that that they do. Uh, yeah, so it was just super exciting. I had a lot of great friends. 
so I'm, I'm a, I'll always be very fond of like London and I like in Scotland and Ireland, but it's just everything for different reasons. Cause I still love Asia. Like, I mean, top of my list for holidays will always be Thailand is just, I mean, the food and the people it's paradise. It's, it's fantastic. It sounds I've also, fantastic. yeah, yeah. It's, it's tremendous. And I first went there to work. So to work. Yeah. I filmed, a. I filmed a fake TV show directed by David Nutter, who's won Emmys for Game of Thrones. He's directed Sopranos. He, Man. He's, he's, he's known as the most famous pilot director. So that's that means uh, our most successful pilot director. So uh, wow. every show starts as a pilot and then the pilot gets picked up and it goes to series. So he has the highest hit record. Of a sh- of a pilot being turned into a series, so if he directs the pilot, odds are it will get made. And if you like look him up, he's directed pilots for some of the biggest TV shows of all time. Like he is the guy. So they had him direct uh, what was people thought it was a TV show, and it was actually a really long, complex commercial for LG televisions. Okay. Um, so he needed people that could improvise and do all this funky stuff. So I got to go there. Uh, I went to Thailand, and it was also it was directed by him. And the co like the first assistant director was uh, Gary Goldman, who's like the producer of Entourage. Uh, uh, what's the other What's the other one he does? Uh, Shameless. Mm-hmm. Shameless. He's directed like most huge of those hits. episodes and produces it. Yeah, huge hits. But the yeah other actors. Uh, uh, Sharni Vincent. She was ended up being the lead in Step Up three or 3d and she hosts a show in australia um aj buckley who's off csi but now he's on that navy he's like one of the leads on the navy seals show another guy named asaf cohen who just guest stars and everything uh and one of his first big things was he was an entourage he plays the uh dubai mm-hmm. <laughs> funny enough yeah, funny dubai enough. investor did the dubai investor that buys uh the medi and the movie for those familiar with the season, so series, so I got to go like to you know I audition, I got the role, and I got to go to Thailand and and film this incredible thing with all these people, and it was uh, just my first big eye opener with Asia, and so uh, with comedy, it's been and acting, it's been an interesting thing because I get paid to go somewhere, and then I'm like, okay, I come home, I sit with my wife, I'm like, that place is awesome, we're going. Yeah. Uh, and then and then we plan like our holiday and stuff around it. Whereas I've been to some places where I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I don't need to go back there. Yeah. Like, I'm glad I got a taste. India, India, India. Like, yeah, it was like, like an amazing experience. But yeah, not when you need again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's I mean, the massive poverty thing. I yeah. mean, it's even whatever I saw in the Philippines was like amateur night compared to India. Right. Like there's just kids pooing in the street it's just like holy crap like yeah. it's mental so uh india was a bit shocking and it's also just you have to be i mean we're living in the age of coronavirus but like if one tainted ice ice cube you can be extremely sick yeah. when i went to india the comics i went with both ended up in the center for uh, tropical disease control wow. like they were hospitalized so sick and yeah, just a piece of lettuce with some water on it or an ice cube. Like we're trying to trace back what they had. But uh, so, yeah, like. Yeah, I would never it's want just to see the inside not that of, one I, of those units. Yeah, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not saying I don't I'm not saying I don't like India. I'm just saying like it wouldn't be somewhere I would rush to go back to mm-hmm. um, in my limited time. I, I, I've seen it. I'm glad I saw it. I had an amazing time, but it, I wouldn't rush back there. Whereas like, you know, Thailand, Tokyo, uh, if we're talking like places far away, yeah. even Costa Rica is amazing, but yeah, I wouldn't rush back there. No, it makes sense. Certain things, it's it's just a, a one-off experience. You learn from it and you take what you will. Right? I'm going to be hacked by the Indian government now. You're going to be, you're going to have a couple people chase it after you. Thank you for sharing this insight with me, dude. Like, honestly, this has been really eye-opening and, and thinking about, it also opens my eyes to the possibilities of acting in comedy. Like, I mean, this is insane. You're here in Canada and you're getting calls to go to Thailand. Did you ever expect to, to have your, your acting work and stuff take you so far? 
No, I would have never uh, dreamed in my life that that would have happened. Uh, and huge. it's huge. But I think that a lot of people do think of, especially with comedy, they really think of it as just where they live. Like, oh, like, it's like, look, you just you don't need to be near the club. You need to be near an airport mm. when, you know, if you're good enough, you'll be able to play anywhere. And it just takes time to build up the material uh, and just be good enough to start getting recommended to places. And then, yeah, you you play the world because there's no different than like driving from you're in Edmonton, right? You're in Edmonton. Mm -hmm driving to Edmonton to Calgary to go the three hours to drive there. If you were booked, you'd have to go do shows, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's no difference between that to flying to Toronto, which is about three hours to play Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So you just tack on a few more hours and all of a sudden you're doing the weekend in Dublin and you kind of tack on a, instead of just doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you'd find out like, oh, there's a Sunday show in Galway and everyone does that. And then you would fly over to London and do the Monday at the old rope. And then you do, you just sort of make a week of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, or longer, right? There's and some people that like to go on. Yeah. And just, yeah. So you just sort of kind of manage things together. But yeah, you play the world. I'm very glad that I've released three albums because in the term, in the, in the terms of like live standup, like people are not going to be releasing stuff for a long time. Yeah. Definitely. Like, and that's for a long that, time. That, that, I mean, you can call it your arsenal, so to speak, but like a collection yeah, yeah. Of, of material. Yes. Because there's people too, that we're sitting on. There's a lot of people that have, okay, so I got my, my, my newest hour and you know what? I'm going to record it in the summer. I'm going to record it in the summer and it'll be out in the fall. So there's a lot of guys and hey girls. There's a lot of people. A lot of people. A lot of people. A lot of people, Cassius. Yeah. There's a lot of people. Tremendous a lot number. Of pe tremendous number. The biggest number of people ever. There's a lot of people that have – they're sitting on – they were sitting on material and they were too lazy, scared, whatever to go record it. And now, like, they don't know when – like, they had a chance and they didn't go for it. And when we all come out of this, and I don't know when that'll be, mm -hmm. but when you go to do stuff live, it's not going to be the same. And I'm not talking about the audience because that's all going to be fucked up too. But like if I'm telling a story, like, you know, like, oh, I was on the bus, like the, the world we live in, like your story changes because – you have to board through the back or whatever. And there's right. only this many people allowed on now. Like, yeah, at this point, like, time, like, if, like, let's say I'm just like making bullshit out of thin air, but that, like, so let's say I had a story. Let's say you had a story, but oh, I sat next to this guy on the bus and he was doing this on his phone. And I noticed it's like, well, no, everyone knows that you're not allowed to sit next to anyone. Now you have to be three rows apart. So that whole story that someone was sitting on and waiting to record doesn't make any sense now. Right. It would make a sense if it was already recorded because you're like, oh, this is from a slice of time. Mm -hmm. But when you're trying to explain it to a live audience, they're like, wait, you sat next to someone? You fucking lunatic? You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> At least till things open back up. Yeah, but it's going to be I, – I, it's going to be ages. Yeah, like, it's anybody's guess as it, to when that will happen. The idea that you're going to be sitting right next to someone – Man, like it's it's a long ways off. It's a long ways off. It so I, yeah, I have no clue. It's man. a long, you know. But I, I think it's safe to bet that it's going to be a while. But in in either way, I, I'm definitely happy to see comedians, actors, people in this business preparing for that. Saying I don't care if it's three, four years down the road. You know, in worst case scenario, I'm going to adapt and evolve. You know, and and that's that's what yeah, I love to see. And figure I, it out. Exactly. I also see you ramping it, ramping it up online with your online content. Uh, where can people find you on YouTube, and what type of stuff you've been putting up there? Uh, I I put like a my YouTube's quite a mishmash. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff. <laughs> um, I I just an interested guy. Like I like stuff. I like I like doing different things, and so my page reflects that. Um, I mean, I've got a ton of original comedy sketches that I wrote and directed. Um, all my albums, 
like YouTube because of like YouTube music, the playlists of my albums are on there. Oh, nice. Um, I do a tremendous amount of food stuff. Mm-hmm. And like many people, uh, it's self-isolating, self-distancing. A lot of people have stepped up their food game. Mm-hmm. Like there's been a lot of people – like if you go to a grocery store, the if the, um, the, the number one empty aisle right now, the hardest thing to get is flour. Flour, flour and yeast. Yeah, flour – flour yeast and sugar like that aisle if you're in a grocery store is is fucking gone man Mm -hmm. because people have learned to adapt going okay well i can't just be going out to buy bread every day and on the freezer space and so like if you have flour you can make buns hot dog buns bread cake you can make it all and it's like really not that hard yeah. So as someone like myself, who's been like a really hardcore home cook and barbecuer, this has been quite fun for me to uh, to try different things, step up my game more. And I've been filming a lot of stuff that's quite accessible. I've been deliberately saying like, look, these are five ingredients. Uh, substitutions are simple. And even uh, Jamie Oliver, who is, uh, you know, you know, who Jamie Oliver is. Yeah. Chef, yeah. Yeah, he's like, yeah, massive chef in England. Mm-hmm. Um, he's even made a TV show called like uh, uh, Keep Cooking and Carry On or Carry On, Keep Cooking um, about cooking at home with limited ingredients. Like oh, he's cool. made it from his own house. I think his wife films it, nice. but it's an actual broadcast to air show. And that's like basically what myself and other people have been trying to do at home. Uh, and again, it's making the best of our situation and at the same time doing what I did before just with a few modifications, but keeping that content out there. Um, I think my YouTube, it's weird because they give you like a, like a vanity URL or something. I think Mm -hmm. it's YouTube. I think it's slash Tom comic. Okay. Um, but if you, but if the links are all on my, on Twitter and Instagram, I am Mr. Tommy Campbell, Mr. Tommy Campbell. Mr. Tommy Campbell. And, and we'll put the links to all this in the bio as well. Yeah. So the, the links are all going to be there, but there's a weird YouTube thing where like I went to share something and it said youtube.com. Have you ever seen this? Mm-hmm. Slash C, like a slash C and then slash your name. Yeah. Like yeah. Channel. So, but that, okay. So that comes up as Tommy Campbell. But if yeah. you, yeah. So anyway. I won't be hard to find. I'm easier to find uh, uh, in the pub because I'm in, on the floor <laughs> yeah, crying. You can find him at the brewery um, district. <laughs> in, the, in the brewery. and um, But yeah, so and I've been having a lot of fun like just stepping up. And thank you for noticing, like doing a lot of stuff. And as you and I have discussed endlessly, like I will get trolls try to come at me <laughs> because I have a very big presence on Twitter mm-hmm. where – uh, as a joke writer, I really like Twitter because you can be crafty with words, you can be topical. So um, my YouTube is not as popular, but I don't give a shit. And yeah, it's, who cares? Because I'll have the same video, like I'll post a video to Twitter, and and I've had videos that have you know thirty five, fifty thousand views, and then I'll put this and I'll put the same video on YouTube, and it's I, I go to check it, I'm like, all right, twelve people have seen this. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a tough market. So, man. Yeah, and I haven't like pushed it as hard. Like I'm more of the content guy than the, I don't know, the marketing side of it, I guess. Mm. But it is funny to see like I will get trolled, be like, "Oh, you loser! You only have twelve views," and I'm like, "Look, I'm not doing it for you." Yeah, that's the main thing I've learned in life. If I'm trying to make this to hit a number or get the specific reaction, then quit. Do yeah. it because you like it. Do it because you like it. You know, I, I make agree. food. I, I make food I want to eat. I make food I want to share. Like, hey, I enjoyed this. I think you'll like it too. And if you don't, whatever. But that's the attitude. Like, just do it because you like it. I always say that same thing. You know, Keith Richards didn't pick up a guitar because he wanted to be a millionaire rock star. He liked the way it sounded. He liked, he liked making music that's it you know so do it because you enjoy it and then success whatever there's no measure of it is if you're happy and you're being honest with yourself uh then you'll always be happy and you'll always feel successful you know i would rather be yeah but like yourself be be a creative 
interesting, kind person. I would rather be that person than, let's say, a really successful artist like that's never written any of their songs. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a record company or like there are comedians who do not write any any of their jokes. Yeah, they're like, and they're, like almost. and they're super well known. And uh, yeah, it's just I, I don't want to be that person. Like I like the creativity of it is what's fun, not just the, hey, look at all my fans, yeah. my fans. <laughs> keep it original. Keep it positive, man. And keep yeah. it building. I love that. Tommy Campbell, thank you so much for joining me, my man. It's been an absolute pleasure. Anytime, Cassius. I'm always happy to be on your show. You are an extremely awesome talent. As I've always told you for years, I love this guy. He is great. You too, bro. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. My pleasure.